Thank you. Um, now I would like to give a short presentation on uh, a worst practice rather than a best practice. Um, I'd like to give a short overview, or I was asked to give a short overview about Dieselgate and the impacts on uh, vehicle manufacturing, vehicle industry. Um, <coughs> I'll try to provide a very short timeline eh, um, of what happened. So basically, in 2014, um, the uh, Carbon Air, Res uh, the California Air Resource Board, um, commissioned a study to ICCT, and they gave it to West uh, University, um, the West Virginia University, to find out why there's such a difference between um, European and U U.S. American vehicles in terms of fuel consumption. So that had nothing to do with. Um, air pollutants at the time. And basically these researchers at this uh, U.S. university, they then um, did research, looked into the vehicles, and uh, basically part of their, um, part of their uh, program was to look into on-road emissions. And these tests already uh, also included air pollutant emissions. And basically they found out that there was a strange behavior of two Volkswagen, uh, two Volkswagen models that whenever they put this portable emissions monitoring system, a PEM system, on the vehicle and they drove around with it, they found out that the uh, NOx emissions, the nitrous oxide emissions, were much, much higher than when they put it on a laboratory um, dynamo dynamometer uh, 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 test. Yeah? And it took them a while, because they were not, uh, they were not thinking about um, this being a problem of the car, but this rather being a problem of their methods and uh, their, their measurement methods. And basically after a while they find out that whenever the car is put on a chassis dynamometer, which basically means that the, um, the driven wheels are turning against the resistance, they find out that whenever they put the car of this on, on this uh, dynamometer, the car uh, behaved completely different in terms of uh, uh, air pollutant emissions. Um, compared to when they measured it on on-road tests. And basically, at the end of the game, they found out that um, Volkswagen um, equipped the vehicle with some kind of software which more or less turns off the rather complex um, uh, exhaust treatment system when the car is not on a test bench. Um, that's interesting. I mean, wow. So basically, um, this resulted in a damage to Volkswagen, which I think, I mean, it's still not, I mean, it's still not over at all, yeah? Um, but so far, I think uh, Volkswagen paid something about uh, 25 billion euros or billion US dollars. 25 billion US dollars is really a lot. Um, <clears throat> and funny enough, Volkswagen is still um, the uh, manufacturer with the most uh, cars manufactured. Yeah, I think they are doing quite okay um, this big, this, uh, despite this big, um, this big issue. Yeah? But then also I think it's really important to recognize that it's actually not only about Volkswagen. Yeah? It's basically um, about many manufacturers and it's also not only about European manufacturers, it's also about Japanese manufacturers. And basically it turned out to be um, a pretty, uh, how to say, pretty common practice to use whatever is legal or sometimes illegal to basically comply with uh, test procedures. Um, <clears throat> so, since then, the uh, ICCT, the International Council on Clean Transportation, um, did a number of studies, and basically what they found out is that the moment you um, test vehicles under real world operations, um, most of the vehicles would not uh, achieve the air pollutant regulations which is actually um, demanded by law. Yeah? So what this graph is showing on the um, x-axis, that's basically CO2 emissions in grams per kilometers basically showing fuel efficient cars on the uh, left side and more inefficient cars on the right side. And then <coughs> basically the yellow and the uh, green line, they are, uh, these are the, the Euro 5 limits uh, and, and, and the Euro 6 limit respectively. Um, and basically all the um, orange cars, these are cars which are compliant um, by vehicle homologation 
with Euro 5 or Euro 6, but none of them um, would achieve the actual uh, NOx uh, 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 emissions which are demanded by the test and the real world driving uh, 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 real, real, real world driving conditions. So basically, um, <clears throat> over time, diesel vehicles emitted much more um, nitrous oxide um, compared to what they should have emitted. Yeah? And this gap between um, the actual on-road emissions and uh, the uh, requirement for uh, homologating is actually widening over time. So that's really a pity because I, I mean, I honestly think that diesel engines, they are to, in terms of efficiency, they are, uh, they are uh, superior to, to gasoline engines. This is, there's, there's no doubt about it. Yeah? Um, but putting, basically being, uh, operating in, a, in an environment where margins are, very, are actually very small and where um, the exhaust treatment is getting more and more expensive, apparently made uh, uh, vehicle manufacturers going that way. Um, <clears throat> now, what this slide shows is the number of premature deaths from diesel NOx in 2015. Um, the gray area of the pie charts um, shows the, let's say, it's a very bad word, usual deaths based on uh, what would be allowed by regulation. And then the colored parts, they share basically the deaths which could be attributed to the um, emissions which is in excess of the actual allowed limits. I mean, this is all very theoretical in a way, and I don't think it is very straightforward to, um, to, to actually um, relate premature deaths with air quality. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, how to say, uh, simplification in these kind of uh, calculations. But anyway, what it shows is that almost half of these injuries or these um, fatalities could, be, could have been prevented if vehicles would have been operating under the, um, under the regulated uh, uh, emission limits. This is quite this is quite interesting and quite alarming, I would say. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> so now, Dieselgate had a number of impacts from a personal level, which means that, for example, several uh, Volkswagen managers are or were sentenced to jail. Um, I mean, it's interesting to think about that the person like uh, the CEO of Volkswagen cannot travel out of Germany because the moment he goes out of Germany, he's basically prone to being arrested and being um, uh, uh, being uh, delivered to the U.S. to uh, to to uh, uh, basically uh, uh, spend quite some years in jail. Eh? Um, <clears throat> manufacturers were condemned to pay fines and recompense owners of affected of affected vehicles, in particular in the U.S. So this is the most of the uh, 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 that's the most part of this uh, huge amount of money Volkswagen had to pay. Um, <clears throat> now it's getting interesting. At the local level, this had also some kind of uh, 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 very um, how to say very severe, um, very severe effects. For example, some cities banned or intend to ban the use of diesel cars. In Germany, that is, for example, Stuttgart, but also uh, Hamburg. Then uh, Munich is also discussing this. Um, other cities in uh, Europe is Milan, uh, Paris, London. So, in a personal level, this has quite a big effect. So, basically, if you bought a diesel car five years ago. And uh, now, and you use it to commute from outside the city into the city because you need to go to work. Then, basically, after the ban has been introduced, you need to buy another car. So these are this is a severe impact. At the national level, um, governments plan to end sale of new diesel and gasoline cars. For example, there are some um, aspirational goals, I'd say, from UK and France to do so by 2040. And then on the other side, which is actually really interesting, that in the, U in the, in the European Union, the diesel gate pushed for stricter emission levels, and that way also pushed for, um, let's say, an accelerated introduction of electric mobility, because the emission levels which are 
um, which are set by, or the emission targets which are set by um, European law uh, for the year 2030 and which say that um, vehicles should consume on average almost 40% less than um, the base year which is 2021. Um, and this is all done on a corporate average level. This means the sales weighted average fuel consumption of all vehicles sold by a certain company in a certain year, for example, Volkswagen or Ford or BMW or uh, PSA, um, all the vehicles together and sales weighted, their fuel economy needs to be below a certain threshold. And this threshold is the 40% reduction compared to the year 2021. So basically, this means that um, this, uh, these fuel economy targets, they cannot be achieved with conventional technology only. You need to have at least like 25, 30% of electric vehicles in your sales portfolio to actually be able to, to manage this, to, to achieve this, this target on a, on a corporate average level. So against this background, um, the diesel impact, uh, the diesel gate was actually very, how to say, helpful. Huh? Um, <clears throat> Now, what this graph shows is um, the decline in diesel sales share in a couple of European countries. Um, for example, the blue line is showing the diesel, share, the diesel sales share for Germany. And it's really, that's really uh, interesting. Like in 2012, um, almost 75% of the cars sold in Germany were diesel vehicles. I mean, Germany has some kind of indirect subsidizing of vehicle sales because if you look at vehicle statistics then 50 percent of all new vehicles in the in germany are actually company cars and company cars they have a very short cycle basically they um they they stay with the company for the first three years then they have probably 50,000 kilometers on the clock and then they are sold uh, second hand vehicles to the uh, to the to the to private owners yeah and these company cars they um they see tax benefits so it's quite usual in Germany to actually, if you if you get promoted, you rather get a company car than more money, because for the for the company it's it's cheaper to buy such a company car because they are exempted from a lot of taxes, rather than giving you an equivalent um, uh, amount in terms of salary. Yeah, so it's a win-win situation. But then on the other side, I think that is also clearly a subsidy of the vehicle car manufacturers in Germany, basically. Um, <clears throat> and these vehicles, they are quite often pretty big vehicles, yeah? medium class, whatever, Audis, Volkswagens, BMWs, and hence it's a lot of diesel vehicles. That's why in 2012, almost 75% of new cars were diesels. Now, if you look how this changed in the, quarter, in the first quarter of 2018, by that time, only 40% of new vehicles were diesel vehicles. So this basically means in only, um, in only uh, 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 six years, the share of diesel vehicles of new, on new sales was almost halved. That is a serious impact. <clears throat> um, of course, this entire uncertainty about can I, tri can I drive a, a diesel vehicle in a certain city in two years, um, what will be uh, regulation at the local and national level, this also led to a huge devaluation of diesel vehicles on the second-hand vehicle market and basically um, this added on to the uh, to the situation that uh, much less diesel vehicles were so uh, were sold. Um, <clears throat> now, on the flip side of this is, or the or the, the nice flip side of this is that the Titan CO2 emission regulation um, and also the uh, image loss from diesel gate push the electrification of uh, the electrification target of vehicle manufacturers. If you look at this. Um, table, that table comes from um, the latest EV outlook from uh, the IEA, then you actually see that um, the targets of many of the vehicle manufacturers on uh, how they will change their sales portfolio are actually pretty ambitious. Eh? Um, so, for example, Volkswagen says that by 2025, 25% of the group's sales should be electric. Um, <clears throat> now, This diesel gate also showed that there is a need for much better vehicle emission regulation. So earlier this morning we talked about the fuels. Now it's, about, now it's more about the vehicles. Yeah? And I think there are 
three pillars of an effective vehicle regulation emission system. First of all, um, the vehicle testing to actually homologate vehicles which can be sold into a, in a certain market. This vehicle testing should be based on, um, on good test cycles, on good test cycles which can, um, <clears throat> which can somehow represent the reality. And we learned from the past that the test cycle which has been used in Europe for the past 20 or 30 years, which is the NEDC, the new European driving cycle, is very far away from actual real world conditions. Everybody knows that the fuel consumption values stay that for new cars you'll never achieve them in reality. So these testing schemes they will need to they will need to, re to be reworked. Um, but it's much more than just vehicle testing for homologation purposes. It's also looking into production compliance is that vehicle which had been homologated to actually allow sales in a certain market is that vehicle um, is the actual vehicle which is sold in the market in, in the market is it is it comparable to what has been to, to what had been homologated um, and then it's in use surveillance so basically now you have a you have a lot of different test options either you can do it in a lab you can do it with portable emission systems whereby a kind of portable laboratory is put onto the vehicle and the vehicle is driven around. Um, you can use um, the data which is actually collected with the vehicle on board, or you can use some kind of remote sensing um, mechanisms. All these different test uh, methods, they have their pros and cons. Um, one, let's say, co one, one negative aspect of all the more sophisticated um, test measures is that they um, cost some money. Therefore, um, <clears throat> the uh, FIA Foundation, together with partners, um, founded a new initiative which, initiative, which is called the Real Urban Emissions Initiative. True, UN Environment is not partner of this, emission, uh, on, on the, on, of this in, initiative so far, but I find it very interesting. That's why I'm showing it here. Um, and basically, they are investigating the use of remote testing whereby um, vehicles are not tested with a mobile laboratory but um, you basically have some kind of uh, sensors being installed on the road and these sensors they analyze the fumes of the vehicles which pass by and then uh, together with a sensor which can read the number plate and which then which thus knows which kind of vehicle model it is, which kind of engine it has, and so on and so forth. You can compare actual emissions with um, the uh, uh, tested emissions. It seems like this way of measuring emissions works pretty well. And uh, what the beauty of this is that this is actually a pretty, a, a pretty, a pretty cheap way of measuring real world emissions compared to for example using portable emission systems whereby you need to put some kind of apparatus in a vehicle and drive around with this vehicle and analyzing the exhaust gas um, on board the vehicle just some last slide what this basically showed um, from different um, from different uh, case studies I think one had been carried out in London. Um, it showed that most of the di uh, most of the diesel vehicles uh, nowadays in use they are absolutely not compliant with what they um, with, with, with the with the euro um, with the euro standard they are sold with. Um, this is kind of concerning. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so a lot remains to be done. Um, this was just a very short snapshot about this particular and very interesting case and, and what this means for us we doing policy looking into um, uh, 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 setting rules and trying to enforce these rules um, yeah thank you